really matters? That might be the most important question you can ask. So let's talk about it. Welcome to What Really Matters podcast, Everyday Spirituality with Karen Wyatt. And thank you so much for joining me here again today. I am going to be doing one last episode on wisdom from the Tao, which I started several weeks ago. I thought I was finished with it last week, but then I came up with one more theme that I wanted to share. I've been looking at all of the most common themes that run throughout the Tao. And this final one I'm going to talk about today is life is a paradox. So I'll get into that in just a minute. But if you're new, and you haven't been listening to any of the previous episodes, I'll just explain that the Tao Te Ching is an ancient book of wisdom, uh, by supposedly by the Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu thought to have been written around 2400 years ago. No one knows for sure. So there's a little bit of mystery surrounding it. But the Tao Te Ching is a book of 81 verses that contain wisdom about how to live life. I've written an adaptation called The Tao of Death, also with 81 verses. And each, each verse is, of course, inspired by the original. But I wanted to add in the perspective of death as an essential component of life. And the reason I created this adaptation is because our society right now is very death avoidant and death phobic. And it's our natural tendency to exclude death from our awareness. And yet, the very thing that we need in order to transcend and evolve and grow in consciousness is to become aware of death and to incorporate death into our day to day lives. So by adapting the Tao Te Ching into the Tao of death, I've still kept the wisdom from the original verses, but included death to remind people that it's important to contemplate death and become aware of death on a daily basis. And so this little book of wisdom that I've adapted is a great companion if you are a meditator or you like to contemplate things, if you have a practice you engage in on a daily basis or even for journaling, because you can read one verse a day. That's what I recommend. It's a short book. You could easily read it all in one sitting, but it's best if you take it slowly and gradually and start with one verse a day and just contemplate each verse think about what it means, what it could mean on a deeper level, and how it relates to your life, or something you may be working on or trying to learn. Initially, some of the verses may seem like I either I don't get this, or this has nothing to do with me, or I don't care about this, it doesn't make sense to me. But it's quite interesting when you start thinking about it, and you put this, this message and this theme into your mind, it works on you and gradually inspiration might come to you of, oh, wait a minute, I know what that could mean, or I know how that could apply to my life. So it's an interesting addition to your spiritual practice if you're if you already have one, or something new to take up if you'd like a way to contemplate death more frequently. So that's the book is The Tao of Death. It's available on Amazon. And you should be able to have bookstores order it for you as well. So as I said, the last theme that we're going to study today is life is a paradox. And this theme runs throughout many of the verses in the Tao. And so first we'll look at, well, what, what, does it, what, is, what is a paradox? What does that mean? And a paradox, according to the Webster's Dictionary, is a statement that is seemingly contradictory or opposed to common sense and yet is perhaps true. And it can also be one statement that contains contradictory elements. And so even the very statement that death makes life more meaningful, that's a paradox because our brains have a hard time grasping that, particularly the way we define death and think about death. 
Uh, we, we see death as a tragedy, as the worst possible thing that could happen. It's the opposite of life in our minds instead of being a component of life, instead of being ingrained in life. So the Tao points out numerous contradictions like this and teaches us by way of paradox to be able to have an open mind and to broaden our consciousness when we look at things and also to recognize that two things that appear to be opposite can both be true at the same time. And as we become more integral in our consciousness, that's what we're doing. We're learning how to hold two truths that seem contradictory, but we're able to hold them both and value both of them. So I'm going to read a few verses for you today, as I have been for the past several weeks now, um, that deal with paradox. And we'll talk a little more deeply about each one of these verses verses as we go. So the first verse we'll look at is verse number 36. Uh, this is a longer one, but I'll just I'll just dive in and we'll discuss things as we go. To live by the way of death, you must give up your perception of how things work. Many situations grow worse before they begin to improve. Fever reaches a peak before it breaks. Illness becomes unbearable before healing begins. Chaos disrupts everything before a breakthrough occurs. Let go of control over your difficulties and risk that they will grow worse. Whatever you hope to attain, be willing to live without. That is the secret to finding peace. The way of death teaches the power of paradox, how kindness defeats toughness, weakness overpowers strength, and death is essential for life. But keep this knowledge hidden in your heart. Let your actions reveal the truth. So there's a lot in this one particular verse, and I think you can see why this is something you could study all day, you could study this for a week or even a month and break down each phrase, even look at individual words that are included in the verse. So the very first line is to live by the way of death, you must give up your perception of how things work. And the perception we're talking about here is the perception from lower consciousness of how the world is. So from the time we're born, we're kind of taught how life works, what life consists of, what life is about. We're taught certain truths that most people believe. And yet when we get to higher consciousness, we begin to see through a different lens. We're no longer looking only through lower consciousness, through the ego. We're looking through a much broader, bigger, vaster expanse of wisdom at life in general. And that's when we can see other truths that begin to appear contradictory to what our lower consciousness tells us and has been telling us all along. The essential factor here is that we don't throw out the view of lower consciousness. We don't throw that away or discard it. We hold it in one hand and we bring in this view from higher consciousness and we work to weave them together, as I said before, in order to have an integrated, integral view of what life really is. So we'll look at some of the examples that are given in the Tao. Um, many situations grow worse before they begin to improve. Fever reaches a peak before it breaks. And, and that's actually common wisdom. So it isn't really something that's contradictory to what we have already seen and know in life. Illness becomes unbearable before healing begins. Chaos disrupts everything before a breakthrough occurs. So these are just some examples of how things often get worse before they get better. And as much as we want them to get better, and we're trying to control them and force them to get better, we actually have to 
allow everything to flow through this process of sometimes getting worse first. Allow it, allow things to go downhill and to seem to be falling apart because that's actually part of the path toward the breakthrough, toward healing, toward improvement. So this is an essential piece of life wisdom for us to remember not to get discouraged and to not think that we have failed and to not give up in despair, to remember this concept that things get worse before they get better. And that's a, that's a really good little phrase to keep in your mind and, and to tell yourself from time to time, wait a minute, things do get worse before they get better. So I may be in that part of the journey, that part where everything's getting worse for a while. Um, as we move on, uh, the Tao advises us, let go of control over your difficulties and risk that they will grow worse. So the reason we try to control things is because we want to prevent them from getting worse. And our efforts to control, first of all, are doomed to fail. We cannot control things that are outside of us. And so we will always fail when we try to control things. And when we're doing that, we waste a lot of our energy and our life force trying to push and pull and make things be the way we want them to be. And uh, the Tao also says, whatever you hope to attain, be willing to live without. And that's a fantastic contradiction as well. Have your hopes for something wonderful to happen, but be totally willing to live without that happening. Be totally able to say, okay, I would love it if this worked out, but even if it doesn't, that's okay. I'm on my path. Life is good. I'm in the flow. And so again, it's this, these two different notions. I'm hoping for this. I hope for this to happen. I hope for this good thing to come to pass. But at the same time, I'm willing to, I'm already willing to accept it if that doesn't happen. I'm already here in this place of acceptance and surrender if it doesn't. So we're not being asked to give up the hope to throw that away and never hope for something good. In fact, it's kind of essential keep hoping but understand that our hope doesn't control anything and won't make it happen. Our hope is what brings us energy to keep moving forward and keep trying. It's what keeps us in a more positive state. So maintain the hope, but realistically accept that it may not work out. It may not happen and it will be okay if it doesn't. That is the full awareness of how things are, having both the hope, but also the realistic understanding of what could happen and the ability to say, I'll be all right, I'll do fine, even if what I hope for doesn't happen. We can save ourselves so much suffering and frustration and disappointment if we could live in that place where we maintain the hope, but we live with the reality and we accept the reality and we're not angry or upset about how things could possibly work out. We're, we're just kind of waiting with curiosity to see what will happen. And um, the Tao says, that's the secret to finding peace. And that makes so much sense to me. Usually, any time that I suffer a great disappointment, it's always because I expected too much or made assumptions or so desperately wanted something to happen that I tried to manipulate it and control it and force it. And I didn't do the work of accepting what would it be like if this doesn't happen and reminding myself that I'll still I'll still be okay if it doesn't happen. So I didn't do the advanced work of getting myself into that place of acceptance before the answer or the resolution to the situation even arrived. And so that's why I lost my peace. I became disturbed and upset and disappointed and downhearted because I wanted something so much that didn't take place. 
So I'm not saying that this is an easy thing to do. And it's also not a place where once you once you do it one time when you've worked this out, and you've figured out how to hope for something and but already accept what it would be be like if it doesn't happen, that that you'll always be able to be in that state. No, it's it takes a lot of work every single time you're in a situation and looking forward to something in the future. And so the last paragraph of this verse says, the way of death teaches the power of paradox. And I like thinking of it that way. The the paradox, the seeming contradiction of things is actually where the power lies. And in a verse we looked at a few weeks ago, we talked about how there is power and energy in the tension that exists between two opposite things. And that's really what we're seeing here. There is power in paradox. And the examples are kindness defeats toughness, weakness overpowers strength, and death is essential for life. And so again, those are particularly just remembering death is essential for life. That's a powerful paradox that contains everything that you need in order to live in a very high consciousness manner. And the last line says, but keep this knowledge hidden in your heart. Let your actions reveal the truth. And this goes back to intellectual humility, which we talked about several weeks ago, that when you know a truth, you're far better to let that truth shine forth in how you live, how you show up every day, how you treat other people, um, how you shine in your life, than to go about telling other people what the truth is and telling them they should live by the truth. You're better off demonstrating it to other people and showing it to other people in how you live. And so just to reiterate, a powerful takeaway from this verse is many situations grow worse before they begin to improve. I think if we could just remember that, that simple little mantra we could reassure ourselves and even comfort ourselves oftentimes in situations that feel uncomfortable or frightening or scary to us when we can't quite see what the answer is. Next, we'll move on to verse number 45, a little bit shorter verse, but again, talking about paradox. Um, This verse begins, things are never the way they seem from the outside. That verse also, that's a a great reminder to not make snap judgments or assumptions about anything just by the superficial appearance that you're able to see with your own eyes, that every person, every situation deserves more attention than that, deserves us to take a deeper look, to try to look at what's inside it and to get more information about it. So... A a great reminder right at the beginning, remember that things are never the way they seem from the outside. So we'll move on. The most amazing accomplishments can appear insignificant. A hollow instrument looks empty, yet fills an entire room with sound. A straight path appears crooked. Outstanding talent seems elementary. Deep meaning hides behind simple words. Death appears to be the loss of everything, but is actually the attainment of wholeness. One who follows the way of death knows when to move and when to be still. Recognize that you can change the world by being perfectly quiet. So again, back to the beginning, things are never the way they seem from the outside. And this is just a list of things that sometimes when we think about it, and you could make up your own list of things that seem one way, but are actually another way. And I I like the statement, deep meaning 
hides behind simple words, that sometimes it's the simplest phrase, like death is essential for life, that has some of the deepest, most powerful meaning it could possibly have for our lives. And yet the words themselves are simple. It doesn't take an entire volume to explain that profound wisdom. So again, this idea that things are not the way they seem on the outside, and we have to avoid making assumptions and snap judgments, look deeper, look with our higher consciousness, <clears throat> with our larger vision at everything, and try to see what's inside it, <clears throat> what's behind it, what else could this mean? and not allow ourselves to be swayed too quickly to one side or another of, of how to look at things, but to always look for the higher consciousness view in everything that we possibly can, everything that happens and everything we, we see around us. And a simple example, have you ever met a person who from their outward appearance, maybe the way they're dressed, the way they talk or walk, you draw conclusions about that person. And you might, in your own mind, assume that isn't really someone that I want to know. I don't care to get to know that person. They're not like me. That's not someone I'm interested in. Only to find later, if you actually do get to know that person, this person may turn out to be completely different than you had imagined by looking at the outward appearance. And you may discover that th this is someone who's destined to become a best friend or a soulmate once you look inside and see the deeper meaning. And again, we talk about this all the time, but death is much like that. When we think about death only with our lower consciousness, the ego, which is terrified of death, death seems like such a tragedy, such a waste, such a useless thing. Like why does this, does it have to be this way in our lives until we get to know death? And when we've studied death and worked with it, when we've sat next to someone who's dying and learned about death through their eyes, we suddenly understand what death really is and we can see the place that it has in our lives. And that's essential wisdom that we need in order to live life more fully. And, and I wanted to just go back to the very last sentence or last two sentences which is one who follows the way of death knows when to move and when to be still. And that's what wisdom is. Wisdom informs us and guides us and tells us when it's the right time to act, when we need to do or say something, or when we need to be still and quiet. And the last verse just says, recognize that you can change the world by being perfectly quiet. Because most people think the opposite. You change the world through your actions and by doing something. And yet, of course, we need action. We need to do things to make change happen. But at the same time, we also need times of stillness and quiet so that we ha are able to contemplate and able to seek out the deeper meaning in everything that happens around us. So that was verse number 45. And the last verse I'll share with you is verse number 22. Again, it's a longer verse. Um, so we'll dive into it. The way of death reveals itself through paradox. When you accept your flaws, you become whole. When you seem to be in error, you are actually on the right path. When you feel empty, you are in fact completely full. When you feel most discouraged, you will be renewed. When you do without, you will receive what you need. When you embrace death, you will finally experience life. Those who do not fear death set an example for all others. Because they don't call attention to themselves, their light can be seen clearly. Because they don't try to prove themselves, they can be trusted. Because they aren't attached to their own individual identities, they can be a mirror for others. Because they don't force their personal agendas, 
everything they do is significant. When the ancient wise ones said surrender is the path to attaining everything, they were not using empty words. Only by living without fear of death can you become your best and highest self. So in a way, this this verse repeats the themes that we've talked about before, but gives us more examples and more ways to look at the paradox and that within ourselves, the paradox that can exist within us, that we have to accept our flaws in order to become whole. And if we seem like we're going the wrong way, we're actually on the right path. And when we feel empty, we're actually full. Uh, These, this idea that whatever we understand within ourselves about who we are and what we are, there's more to the picture than what we can see or what we're aware of. And so even when we look into ourselves on our inward arc, We have to look in with the higher view again and see more perspectives than just the way our lower consciousness thinks it is. We have to be able to see the bigger, broader perspective of all of life. And then there's an entire paragraph that's just talking about how if you are living with an awareness of death and you understand the role death plays in life and you even embrace and value death, meaning you have less fear of death, it changes how you live and how you interact with people. And I, I like these reminders that if you're not calling attention to yourself, and it's the ego that does that, that calls attention to itself, your light can be seen more clearly by other people. If you're not trying to prove yourself, again, that's what the ego does. You are more trustworthy because you're living from higher consciousness instead of just from the ego. If you're not attached to your own individual identity, again, that's how the ego behaves. Then you can be a mirror for other people. And if you're not forcing your agenda on other people, then everything you do will become significant. So all of this entire paragraph is is contrasting the ego and higher consciousness. And it's showing that when we operate from the ego, which is the external path that we've been developing, when we operate at that level of lower consciousness, we really restrict and limit who we can become. The ego has a fairly narrow scope. It's a, it's a narrow filter that focuses primarily on the lower self and trying to get what it needs, trying to force and control things and living in fear and living with desire and greed. But when we allow our higher consciousness to inform us and guide how we see the world and how we live our lives, suddenly we become a much more potent force for the good in the world. Our light can be seen. We can be trusted. We can be a mirror for other people. We can behave with significance in everything that that we do. So this verse ends with uh, when the ancient wise ones said surrender is the path to attaining everything. They were not using empty words. So the whole idea of allowing our higher consciousness to inform us requires the ego to surrender. When we talk about surrendering, it's the ego and our lower self that has to surrender its control and power to allow higher consciousness to be the guide and the the source of wisdom for life, how to make decisions, how to move through the world, how to treat other people. And when higher consciousness is the guide, we can become our best and highest self. And that's what we're trying to accomplish on the inward arc. The inward arc is entirely about helping the ego surrender, getting to know our higher consciousness and empowering our higher consciousness and drawing in more wisdom to ourselves so that we can live from this place of being the best and the highest person that we can possibly be. And 
the last statement says, only by living without fear of death can we become that because the ego is the repository of the fear of death. And only when we get past that, when we can transcend the ego and transcend the fear of death, that's when we are truly working toward becoming our best and highest self because we're now empowering higher consciousness. I hope that all makes sense the way I'm explaining it. So that's what I wanted to share today about the idea of life being a paradox. Just remember those messages. Things are not always the way they seem from the outside and that things tend to get worse before they get better. And when you can surrender the narrow view of the ego, you can empower the wisdom and guidance from your higher self. And that's when you'll be able to make a difference in the world. And working on the fear of death and contemplating death, that is one of the most powerful tools you can use to help the ego surrender and to allow higher consciousness to become your wisdom guide. So once again, if you're interested in the Tao of Death, uh, you can learn more about it by going to eoluniversity.com slash books and there you'll uh, find a link for ordering it on Amazon or just go directly to Amazon or ask your bookstore, The Tao of Death by Karen Wyatt. So thanks for joining me today and all these previous weeks listening to this wisdom from the Tao. It's been really fun to share this with you. I'm looking forward to whatever pops up next that comes up for me to share next week, but I'll be back then. So until then, remember that we're here for love. So face your fear of death in particular, be ready for whatever life brings you next, and love each and every moment of your very precious life. Bye-bye.